Hey guys, my name is Chekhov, or you can also pronounce it Chekhov. Uh, today we're going to be drawing uh, Harrow and Gideon from the Locked 2 series. Um, I've never really done this type of video before, so I'm not sure what sort of voiceover this will be. Forgive me for a little bit of rambling. But we'll start off here uh, right away with me just getting a couple of uh, basic proportion studies done very, very quickly. Uh, the thing with imitating the Pokemon style, although I've done it a couple of times already, I always like to look at the official Pokemon art, which has a very interesting um, set of rules to it. Uh, that I like to try to get into my own art as much as possible if I am going to be trying to draw something that copies down from it. And you can kind of see me uh, using a couple of things here. A um, couple of other characters that have uh, similar proportions to the characters that I plan to be drawing. So you can see that I've based um, Harrow off of uh, the character on the left here. Uh, Goodness, I already forgot her name. I didn't know it at one point. Uh, and I'm using red for uh, Gideon. Just uh, because, unfortunately, Pokemon doesn't really have a lot of female characters that have a kind of top-heavy build. Um, although, as I was drawing it, I realized that, technically speaking, neither did red. Um, he's kind of got real wide hips there uh, to kind of more solidly uh, emphasize his uh, pretty confident stance. Uh, but nevertheless, he was kind of the closest thing that I could get uh, that matched the kind of attitude that I wanted Gideon to have, so I picked him for that, um, but I'm not actually going to be using the traced uh, sketches that I did. Uh, as you can see, I'm kind of drawing Harrow freehand here on the left. Um, and just kind of measuring up her proportions against the outline on the right hand side just to make sure that I don't um, stray too far as it were from uh, the sizing that Pokemon usually does for their characters which is of course uh, because it's a cartoon they usually uh, give them pretty large heads the usual uh, anime proportions which works well, because whenever I draw Harrow, I usually end up giving her a pretty large head and very small uh, limbs anyways. Something that I really have uh, become more aware of as I've gotten more confident in drawing is the fact that if you have an art program that allows you to select certain elements and just kind of stretch them to and fro and readjust them, you should definitely do that. Um, not the mark of a bad artist at all to just kind of play around with those things and resize them and remold them to your liking. Uh, it really helps and in fact I constantly do this in my own art. I will, uh, as I just did, pick up certain elements like the head and resize it if I think it looks too big. Or, as I'm doing now, draw and redraw a certain limb until something looks right. Couldn't decide what to do with her right hand there for a solid moment. And today we're going to be uh, giving these to some Pokémon as well. Uh, I've decided uh, that uh, a Duskull probably uh, is the, going to be the best for Harrow, and I've ended up putting his eye in just the left hand socket for now, just because putting it in the middle really makes it look goofy. And although Harrow does deserve a goofy Pokemon, I think for uh, this one, we're uh, going to try to make them look a little bit cooler. And just behead her for a second there. Uh, I actually uh, kind of uh, discussed with a friend about what Pokemon uh, Harrow would have. I ended up, uh, of course, going with a Duskull eventually. Uh, I also wanted to give her a second one, which you will see a little bit later, but for now we're going to try to go with Gideon, 
see what would be the best uh, for Gideon. I'm going to struggle with the pose here uh, in a little bit. Give her a very standard uh, kind of anime protagonist hairstyle, which is to say not really any hairstyle at all. Just a whole bunch of triangles on top of her head. You gotta love it. I was constantly uh, struggling at this point uh, with the sword that Gideon was going to have over her shoulder. Of course, it's not really going to be a sword, it will be her hone edge. Uh, however, I had to const constantly move her away from Harrow just because the sword was constantly poking Harrow in the back of the head. Um, so, I guess uh, those that shall not be separated ended up getting, being separated uh, in the end anyways, uh, just because I could not for the life of me plan in my head where I was going to put them. And the proportions on uh, Gideon here turned out to be a little bit wonky and then anyways I ended up rotating her in my mind but also on the canvas multiple times just because I couldn't quite figure out how to make her look uh, cartoony but at the same time also uh, proportionate to Harrow herself and at the same time kind of makes sense within the stance that they were going to be doing and I fail uh, on that count anyways but it looks good enough for me which I think is the most important part of it one piece of advice that I definitely have is that you should not do as I do and constantly freehand everything uh, it's a lot easier if you actually have some sort of uh, reference for an object for example a sword which I am in no way qualified to draw, especially when it comes to a hand holding a sword, which I am very bad at, which is why I ended up giving Gideon here a very loose grip on the end of the sword. Sorry, the pommel, is that what it's called? Not really anything I planned out here, I just wanted to have her be holding it, and I ended up just freehanding whatever felt right, but uh, as you will see later on, I ended up going back and redrawing her hand and resizing her hand multiple times because when you see it here, it is clearly about the size of her entire face, which although uh, your hand should technically be approximately the size of your face, it should be uh, the length between the heel of your palm and the tip of your middle finger is approximately going to be the same as uh, the length from your chin to the top of your forehead. Not always, but that's a good rule of thumb. Or rule of hand, I suppose. And clearly we're going to be giving uh, Gideon a cue bone here. Really a very simple choice. Uh, I ended up basically being surprised at myself when uh, it took me so long to come up with it. If only because it just makes so much sense, doesn't it? If you think about it too long, you end up getting into uh, weird little head cannons, thinking about like, well, uh, where did the skull come from? Was there a Marowak involved somehow? And it's just not that deep. Gideon doesn't have a mom. Cubone doesn't have a mom. It's a skull-themed Pokemon. We're we're gonna go with it. We're just gonna go with it. Another thing that I really like doing, especially for uh, Gideon, who doesn't have any sort of piercings or any sort of other paraphernalia that I usually give to the houses as decoration, uh, I usually end up doing Roman numeral earrings or something similar in order to kind of signify their house. Um, but Gideon, who doesn't really bother with that, I end up often drawing her belts or the bootstraps on her boots in that sort of I X pattern that signifies the ninth house. It's just a fun little thing to do. It's always fun to throw little details in there like that. And as you can see, I also ended up giving um, Gideon, or sorry, I also ended up giving Harrow a phantom, which in this case was not going to be wooden because that makes no sense. Uh, Harrow and Gideon live in a world where trees are not really something that you come across very often. So instead, and it's a little bit harder to see here, but uh, Phantom is actually going to be shiny here and its head, the thing that contains its more ethereal dark body, is actually made of metal. There's a little bit of grating on the side 
that I tried to draw to give it a kind of more industrial look. And if you have finished uh, Gideon the Ninth, you will know what that means. Uh, and you will know what the gas leaking out through the vents also means. And putting that together with Phantom's Pokedex entry uh, might reveal to you why specifically that little Phantom follows Hera around. Don't know if it would ever evolve into a Trevenant or if it would evolve into something else. Might be uh, something to consider. And here I'm just putting uh, the finishing uh, touches on the sketch making sure that everything else uh, is easy for me to go over when I start lining. Even this in this stage though, my sketches do end up being extremely messy. But the most important thing of course is that I uh, am going to be trying to copy the Pokemon line art style as much as I can, which means no line variation as you can see Pokemon art usually doesn't have a lot of uh, line variation. It's all pretty even. Uh, another point is to make sure that the eyes are usually typically open. The typical anime eyes. The nose is very small and the mouth, especially for cuter characters, ends up having that little space in the middle. But aside from that, we're just going to try to keep a very thin, even line weight. And every once in a while we'll have it skip a little bit and uh, we'll get straight to it. Line art is probably my favorite part of the drawing process. It's really neat uh, just to space out and allow my hand to do what it needs to. I often leave my sketches very, very loose just so that I can kind of have the joy of drawing through doing line art again. Maybe I'm a little bit weird for that. I also realized that I drew Harrow's eyes probably a little bit closer to my own style than to the Pokemon style in this case, but I feel like I can be forgiven for that. You know, we'll also want to get rid of all of the super pointy parts of the line art. Pokemon usually doesn't leave a lot of things like that. And I also ended up changing Harrow's earrings to look a little bit less like penises, which I feel like she would probably appreciate. And naturally we have to give her the little ahoge, because although she's not an idiot, she kind of is. Just a little bit, at least when it comes to Gideon. Gotta zoom out, make sure everything still looks proportional. Something that I should probably mention is that if you are trying to accurately copy the Pokemon art style, you don't actually want to go for a lot of detail. Pokemon art, uh, even if it's just box art, uh, like the kind that we were just referencing, often doesn't include a lot of small detail uh, on their characters. If you look at all those buttons on the jacket, everything is very much simplified into basic shapes. So although I typically draw Harrow with those gloves and with the bone inlay on them, I would probably say that if you want to be more accurate to that style, you shouldn't do it. And just now my friend ended up showing me a little bit of uh, a project that he was working on. <laughs> the rest of the line art is pretty self-explanatory, so I'll just uh, go ahead and let it run for a little bit. And if there's anything else to comment on, I will try to do that.
something that's always good to do is to try to get references for the things you're drawing if you are not super confident about how they should look. I definitely do not do that, especially with bones, despite the fact that I do like looking at bones. I feel like, especially for drawing something like a Pokemon fan art, uh, you benefit more from just simplifying it and making the shapes as readable as possible. Accuracy is not always going to get you the results you want, although it definitely has its place. I could have looked up what the radius and ulna bones generally look like and how they're positioned, but I didn't. I just went with Mugut. So I am aware that also the corset ribcage that Harrow wears is not really accurate to how an actual ribcage looks, uh, nor are any of the vertebrae, but eh, I figure. It's more about the feeling that it gives. I do think I ended up looking up uh, some references for the foot bones, at least a little bit. I wanted to see exactly how many of them were in there to give myself kind of a chance to more or less replicate that feeling. Why does Hero have bones on her shoes? I don't know. I also realize now as I'm looking at it, I never actually gave uh, any line indications as to where her boots end, so it's entirely possible that she is just wearing a onesie that ends in high-heeled boots. Which seems extreme, but it is Hero, so... Who even knows? Realistically, none of her outfit makes sense here. Why does she have bones glued to her, uh, leather skirts? I don't know. Why does Hero do anything? For the drama, presumably. I have to wonder how many other artists use what I would call the brute force method. Which is to say, you just draw and redraw things until they look approximately right, instead of ever pulling up any reference images. Because, honestly, sometimes finding the correct reference image that actually has the same feeling that you're going for ends up taking way too long. And you just don't want to bother. Bonus points to Duskull here for being extremely easy to draw. He is literally just a little skull boy with some squiggles and some funky arms. I give it up for Duskull. Makes it really easy to just kind of give him vibes as opposed to trying to match any sort of body. And at this point I realized that I had been drawing for over an hour and had not actually saved the file as anything, so I went to do that really quick. Don't make that mistake, kids. Your computer will die at the most inopportune moment and you will lose a whole bunch of work, so... Greatly recommend saving as many times as possible and backing up your work because it's real dangerous. If you're unfamiliar with Pokemon, I think it would be probably really easy to grow somewhat disturbed by the fact that I have made uh, one of Harrow's most dramatic childhood secrets, as it were, into a little Pokemon buddy that follows her around and reminds her that she is in fact 200 dead kids in a trench coat, but if you know Pokemon lore, actually this is not really all that disturbing, because Phantom is literally supposed to be just the soul of a child. That has been lost and, uh, and or abandoned, if memory serves me right. Some of those Pokemon entries, oof. I can't blame him though, kids love that sort of stuff. I did end up making him look a little bit like a toaster, though. I went back and changed the amount of vent slits that were in there to make it a little bit more than two to not suggest that Hera was being followed around by a toaster, but... 
That is also an accurate rep representation of what's happening, let's be honest. Always love making Gideon look a little bit unhinged. I think she deserves to go apeshit every once in a while. Giving her them big old eyes. One of the most fun things about characters with sunglasses is that you have to find really amusing and inventive ways to have their eyes show from behind those sunglasses. Either by making them see through, which is not really an option in this case since Gideon's glasses are canonically mirrored, or by just tilting her head this way and that to kind of suggest that there's a little eye peeking out from it over and over again. I don't usually know what people like to talk about in these kind of videos. I know many people find it quite comforting to just listen to an artist ramble as they draw. It can be a sort of visual ASMR, and that's great. Uh, I do feel as though I can't say a lot uh, about the books, because obviously I don't know if the people who are watching this have read all the way up until the latest book, but uh, does make you wonder about the Hone Edge. <laughs> Not sure I have any answers uh, as to what its nature is <laughs> in this specific universe, but it is definitely something to think about. Something that I know really disturbs uh, beginner artists, or at least maybe it disturbed me. Maybe the kids these days don't really bother with it at all, but when you're first starting out, drawing the butt or the crotch area of any character can turn into an exercise in basically trying to stifle your giggles. Or you're trying to draw the butt, oh, do I make it bigger? Do I make it smaller? Well, I always make it bigger. That's, that's my plan. I always make it bigger. Nowadays, I gladly draw any butt of any character, and I no longer feel weird drawing the crotch area either. It's just something you gotta get used to. Hey, it's all bodies. It's not... none of it's bad. Definitely gotta give Gideon a tush, though. Let's be honest. She has worked for it. Or maybe she hasn't. I don't actually know if she uh, ever focuses on her legs. I feel like since she basically spends all of her free time doing, what is it, push-ups? Uh, maybe she has neglected leg day a little bit. Seems like it would be in character. Although if I had endless free time and nothing to do but train, I'd probably try to balance it at least a little bit. Something that is also inevitable is the fact that as you are drawing, you will end up making mistakes, not realizing what they are, and then you come back and you realize that you no longer have any time to fix them. That's fine. That's normal. Another thing that maybe all artists do, I'm not entirely sure, uh, but I always save the thing that I want to draw the most for last, just to give myself a little treat to look forward to. In this case, uh, it is Cubone. Uh, as you can see, I'm not really focusing on him right now, he's the last thing that I've got to line, and that is because uh, drawing more organic shapes like Pokemon is definitely one of my favorites, so... It's always good to start out with that, just to give yourself a little bit of a head start, start feeling good, but I always like to save something I really want to draw for last as well, just because you end up leaving the line art uh, kind of in a good mood, as it were. Something else 
I definitely noticed while I was lining this is the fact that, technically speaking, the Cubone skull could be a Charizard skull. And Cubone does kind of look like a Charizard. Maybe there's some sort of an evolutionary tie there between their lines. I think I probably wonder about Pokemon taxonomy a little bit too much. Pokemon have got to be genetically related quite a bit, right? only people listen to me. My latest theory is the fact that the Tangela line is actually uh, distantly related to Mimikyu. And here we have the line art. Now something I really greatly recommend to any artist, beginner or otherwise, is that after you do uh, a certain amount of drawing, for example, when you finish the sketch or when you finish the line art, I greatly recommend that you just let it sit for a day or two days, or at the very least, like an hour. Get up, walk away, get yourself a cup of coffee, um, look at it again with some fresh eyes, because with an absence of anybody to critique your proportions, you yourself uh, are fully capable of critiquing uh, it. You just need to kind of refresh your brain and delete the cache, as it were. And next we're going to be coloring, which uh, if you have been familiar with me or my work for any amount of time, it might not surprise you to know that it's my least favorite part. So we're going to try to get through this as quickly as possible. One of the first things I do whenever I need to color something is to save myself some grief. I usually end up basically using the magical select tool, wand select tool, to outline everything and then just inverse it so that I can fill in the areas that I need colored with just a solid block of a tone that I'm probably not going to be using for the picture. This allows me to just very quickly uh, fill it in with the flat colors uh, and I don't have to worry myself too much about straying outside the lines. It's just something that I find that makes it easier. Obviously it might be a little bit more difficult to do if your line art frequently ends up being, um, ends up having gaps as it were. So obviously you have to kind of put on a little bit of work. And then I go in, fill in a couple of shades as I need. Here I am actually using the references to pull a couple of separate darker tones because if I just did everything in black it would not be nearly as interesting. We have a nice uh, lighter bone shade for the accents in Hero's outfit, but her hair I ended up actually making a slightly purplish tone uh, just to kind of complement her skin tone for that. Whereas for Gideon, obviously, uh, she's also going to be kind of full of different darker tones. But she does have her orange hair, which I couldn't quite decide on the shade of for a while. One of the things about using different shades of black is you want to vary it up, I think. I think. I say this as somebody who just told you that I did not really like to color. But one thing that I do know as a viewer of art is that it's a lot more interesting to look at different shades of what we would colloquially refer to as black. None of it is really black. Um, the coat that uh, Gideon has kind of thrown over her shoulder or the uh, mantle as it were is the same kind of deeper purple color as Harrow's uh, hair whereas her jeans or her pants are a kind of like deeper, darker blue. Harrow's own outfit is closer to a more even-toned gray, but all of these variations are subtly caught by the human eye, even if it's not something we actively pay attention to. If I was to make it all just a single shade flat of, uh, flat shade of black, it would not be nearly as interesting. And from there we can go in and I am color picking from the Cubone and the other Pokemon here, but I am consciously choosing to 
pick some of the mid-tones and not the most highlighted ones, just because it fits a little bit better for what I need. Put a little bit of gradient on Gideon's sunglasses here. Really quickly, a uh, color picked for the bone edge. And again, I'm not making it the simple kind of golden hilt. I am going for something closer to what the ninth house would have. And the little dust skull is pretty simple, although I did make it also a little darker overall, just to give it a more of a spooky feel. And after that, we went in. We are going to be making the phantom shiny, as I've said. However, the shininess is kind of represented by the fact that it is wearing a metal grate on its head as opposed to a tree. From here, now that I've uh, done the flats and figured out most of the things I need, we're going to go back to the reference image and kind of see what we need to do to replicate that slightly watercolor-like uh, style. I ended up actually changing the base color to a pink. I really like to shade without all the uh, colors present because it allows me to actually concentrate on the shading aspect on the actual shape of the characters instead of getting kind of boggled down by the colors uh, and it helps because then you're not concentrating necessarily uh, or on accident on the break between the different color lines such as the pokeball and her glove and instead you're just literally going through trying to imagine uh, what the shape of the thing would be and you end up with an overall a little bit more balanced picture, at least in my opinion. Now, I don't claim to be any sort of expert in shading. In fact, as far as artists go, I am by no means a professional. But if you are a beginner artist and you're just kind of looking for uh, some tips and tricks to get you slightly better habits, I do recommend possibly shading before you color, just because it will allow your attention to stray closer to what you actually need to be focusing on. Pokemon, uh, it has to be said, also does this very interesting uh, thing with their shading where often if a character is in a kind of forwards and backwards stance, they will do this thing where they wish will shade most of the back leg that the character has uh, kind of tipped away from the viewer, which is exactly what I've done for Harrow here. Uh, her right leg is going to be mostly thrown into shadow. And I'm not going to be going very heavy on shading her face simply because Pokemon usually doesn't do that. Uh, they usually allow the face to be mostly in light, so we're not going to be focusing too much on that. Instead, I will be putting the phantom in mostly shadow. And once you check with the colors, doesn't look too bad, seems fine to me. So we're moving on to Gideon, same thing for her leg as well, uh, since her left leg is kind of facing a little bit uh, further away from the viewer. Uh, put that into a complete shadow, as well as the Cubone, just because it, uh, weirdly, ironically, despite the fact that it will be kind of fully shadowed here, it puts it into a little bit more of a focus, uh, just because it is so, uh, hidden. And it's a little bit messy, but that's alright. If you actually zoom in on a lot of official Pokemon art, it's not always going to be perfectly crisp either. Uh, that's kind of one of the attractive features of it. Looks a little bit more organic. So after we finish uh, shading Gideon's butt here, we're going to just go back and do some details. Part of the detail, obviously, is the sword. I did give it a little bit of shade here, but realistically, I should have probably left it uh, to do the highlights for the metallic sheen. That still never hurts to try. And again, we're going to be leaving most of her face um, as is, without shading too much. Uh, just going to be going back, checking with the colors, everything looks good. And then we go back, uh, do an add layer, and add some highlights. 
And that of course includes the hair, as well as the sword, as well as the sunglasses. And add a little bit of highlight. Pokemon usually utilizes this thing where they give uh, a very crisp uh, small amount of highlights on several objects, but then what they also do, aside from those smaller details, is they will go in and actually do large swaths of a lighter color. And just to give a general idea of like, oh, this area is really sticking out. And that's what I'm doing here, uh, primarily with Gideon's hair and uh, their legs, which are facing a little bit forward. Give their eyes a little bit of sheen, do a little bit of detail. Still not sure if I made the right choice on that one. Um, but after that, the only thing left to do is to just kind of uh, leave it for a while and then went back uh, and realized that I had actually forgotten all of their face paint. So that had to be done. This one uh, was probably the hardest uh, part for me just because I wasn't sure how to balance the decorative face paint with the typical simplicity the Pokemon demands, uh, or the Pokemon art style demands rather. Uh, I did end up making Harrow's face paint a little bit more crisp and detailed just because uh, it makes more sense for Harrow. Once again, use that little watercolor style to kind of make it a little bit washed. Uh, but for Gideon, uh, I ended up very simply just kind of rubbing it all over her, which I figure she usually doesn't care about the face paint, so it's fine to make it a little bit messier. Still does the intended look, though. And uh, with that, it's almost finished uh and at the end i just went back and i gave phantom those little ear things that they usually have however instead of the branches of the tree part it is noxious gas which just happened to be used for uh killing some kids that's a family friendly thing to say on a youtube channel right now i'm probably gonna get demonetized anyways i don't even know if i am monetized I don't think I am. I don't even know what that means. And here we have the finished product. I actually went back and ended up changing some of the details on Phantom to like make it look less like Harold was being haunted by a toaster, as I've mentioned. Uh, but overall, I like how it turned out. This piece took me about uh, a total of two and a half hours, which is quite quick. I don't recommend you do a marathon like this just because you really have to step away from a sketch and you really have to step away from line art to give yourself a little bit of time to cool down and just kind of make sure that you're looking at it with a new eye. But overall, just for a fun little uh, drawing and painting session, it wasn't too bad and I might end up doing this uh, more often. So if you would like to see more of these videos, definitely leave a comment uh, and don't subscribe because I don't care about that. But if you want to, you can watch this space for more visual ASMR videos. See ya!